Okay, so who here has ever struggled to stick to a diet or any kind of healthy change? You sort of decided that you're going to go low carb but you end up eating chips and cheeseburgers or you decide that you're going to meditate every day but by the end of the day it just doesn't happen or that you're going to go to the gym on Monday, Wednesday and Friday and it just doesn't happen. Well, you are definitely not alone. So my talk today is when you know what to do but you can't seem to do it. Overcoming the blocks to healthy lifestyle. So my name is Dr. Mary Barson, um, and as mentioned, I am co-director of Real Life Medicine with my wonderful colleague, Dr. Lucy Burns, and we do online medical health and weight loss uh, courses with intensive coaching. I'm a GP, and I wanted to um, express my cognitive bias, I suppose. I follow a low-carb, real food diet, and it really works for me. I am someone who, unfortunately, was born with quite severe polycystic ovarian syndrome, suffered with significant symptoms my whole adult life, until I came across low carb a few years ago. And simply by changing my food, I managed to completely normalise my metabolism, fatty liver gone away, polycystic ovarian syndrome in complete remission, like total sort of biochemical health. So it really works for me, and that kind of colours all that I do, and uh, not in a bad way, though. So behaviour change, this is what we're talking about. If you want to reap the benefits of a low-carb lifestyle, you have to do a low-carb lifestyle. It's not going to work otherwise. And for some people, this change happens really, really easily. For most people, it doesn't. And I'm going to go through two case studies now um, from my practice as a GP. This first guy, Mr HM, that's not his real photo. He didn't consent to having a photo, but he did consent to me talking about him. Um, changed really quite easily. So he's a 39-year-old male, a software developer, BMI of 31.2, um, an elevated waist circumference of 112 centimetres, and he came to see me in my GP clinic complaining of gastroesophageal reflux disease. And it was really troublesome for him, and he was open to the idea of lifestyle intervention to treat his gourd, which was fantastic. And because of his weight and his elevated waist circumference, I convinced him to do um, some bloods. And I got him to do an insulin curve, which is like a glucose tolerance test where you also measure insulin um, at fasting and then an hour after a glucose load and two hours after a glucose load. And as you can see, he's got um, a fasting insulin of 27. It's, he's, he's got marked hyperinsulinemia. At an hour after his glucose load, his insulin shot up to 255, so really high. And at two hours, it only come down to 207. And you can also see his glucose there. It's actually not that bad. Uh, so his glucose metabolism is quite normal, but he's got severe insulin resistance. I calculated his HOMA IR, which is really high, which indicates he's got insulin resistance. And I also discovered that he had fatty liver disease. He was a non-drinker. This was non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, part of his insulin resistance syndrome. So Mr HM came back um, and I spent an hour with him, which I often try and do. Sometimes I do it over multiple visits, but if I can, I spend a whole hour with patients when I'm introducing low-carb lifestyle. And I gave him an hour of education, motivation and discussion. So I explained to him what insulin resistance is, told him about insulin, explained the consequences and potential problems of him having high insulin, told him how to fix it, gave him some food lists. We've got these green lists, red lists and orange lists that we give out. And I also talked to him about how you can build a plate, how you can structure your meals um, and how you can plan your meals throughout the day. And that was, that was it. He took it on board. He was, he was really quite positive and motivated. And then a few weeks later, I got him back just to see how he was going. I retested his liver function test, and wonderfully, his, um, the inflammation in his liver from the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease had resolved. I love this. This is one of the best things about um, low-carb medicine. And he was doing good. He felt good. He had transition phase, you know, the keto flu sort of symptoms, but he was doing really well and he had buy-in and he was on board. And then I didn't see him again. I work in a fairly sort of rural community, so I did see him around. We particularly used to walk our dogs along the same sort of path. And I could see him. He was looking good. He'd smile at me. I could tell he was losing weight, but he didn't come and see me as a GP because he didn't need to. And then about a year later, he came in just for a vaccine. He was expecting his first baby. Well, his partner was expecting their first baby, which was great. And so I had a chat to him, and he had lost 15 kilos. 
Um, his BMI was like down to 26.1. He was feeling great and he was just doing it. He was just doing it. With one hour intervention from me, he was doing it. And I am permanently fascinated by behaviour change because as a GP, it, it's, it's like 80% of my practice is trying to help people or motivate people to engage in healthy behaviours. So I was like, HM, mate, what is your secret? How, how are you doing this? How are you staying motivated? And with wide eyes and a big smile on his face, he said, it's because you scared the shit out of me, doctor. <laughs> And I was a little bit taken aback because I actually don't consider myself particularly scary. But I can see in this instance, it was a really, really um, positive um, sort of, you know, dollop of fear. And look, he didn't change because of me. He didn't change because I told him what insulin was and gave him some food lists. You know, I'm not that powerful. I'd like to think that I was, but I'm not. He changed because he was intrinsically motivated. He found the motivation within himself, all of the reasons within himself to just start and to keep going. And I have to say that this is not all that common. Certainly in my clinical practice and with our online coaching programs, it's not usual that one sort of one hour's intervention can result in a lifetime of change. I love this quote from Bill Fordyce, who is a behavioural psychologist back in the 1980s, and he says, education is to behaviour change as spaghetti is to a brick wall. It's like, education is important, it's vital, it is a vitally important piece of the behaviour change puzzle, but it is usually not enough. And talk about another patient of mine who did manage to make sustainable lifestyle change, but it was not as easy for this person. Also not her real picture. So Ms MA is a 45-year-old female. She's a busy mum of three. When I first met her, she had three kids under eight, and she worked nearly full-time as a project manager. She had BMI of 36.4. She had also had an elevated waist circumference of 106 centimetres. And she came and saw me for help with weight loss. She knew I was a low-carb GP, and that is why she came and saw me. I met her actually in 2018, but I've got some sort of blood test results from her past history here. So she had struggled with her weight pretty much her whole adult life, had been caught up in the diet culture of calorie restriction. She'd done shakes and meal plans and... Um, you know, you name it, she'd tried it, everything except bariatric surgery. And it had just set her up for this lifetime of yo-yo dieting, because that, unfortunately, is what the old advice, well, the standard advice of calorie restriction generally generates for people. Oh, and you can see here that she's had metabolic disease for a long time. An ultrasound in 2009 showed, showed that she had fatty liver disease. Um, and at the end of 2016, she was living in Sydney, I didn't know her then, and she... Um, caught up with a nutritionist who put her onto low carb, gave her some education, gave her a meal plan, and she went low carb, and she loved it. She lost weight, uh, she lost 12 kilos without hunger, she was like, oh my goodness, this is sustainable, I can do this, I finally found something that works. She was doing really, really well. Then in 2017, she moved to Geelong, that's where she, where she found me, and um, new job, increased stress, she lost the momentum and she reverted back to her old eating habits. She gained all the weight back on plus a bit more and her fatty liver returned. So I met her in early 2018 and when I first met her I did some bloods as I usually do. And you can see there that yes, she's got some fatty liver has returned, she's got some elevated fasting blood sugar and she has elevated insulin and her HbA1c is definitely creeping up into that nearly diabetic range. And so I did what I did with Mr HM, but she already knew a lot. She had a lot of knowledge, so she didn't need heaps and heaps here, but I did, you know, go through what insulin is, what insulin resistance is, gave her the food list, talked about meal planning and how she can plan her meals. But because she needed it, over several visits, I also went through the psychology of behaviour change. I did lots of health coaching and one-on-one -on -one sort of counselling with her, um, mindset training, getting her to identify her blocks and getting her to come up with ways how she can overcome them. And did lots of mindset training, including, very importantly, learning how to cultivate self-kindness and self-compassion. Sounds airy-fairy, but it actually is a really important part of sustainable lifestyle change. 
And it wasn't easy for her. She had a lot of stress in her life, she had a lot of demands, and it actually didn't happen all that quickly. She, for her in particular, a massive block to her lifestyle change was stress, and she would emotionally eat to deal with her stress. And then after she emotionally ate, particularly for her, it was ice cream and biscuits. After she ate some ice cream and biscuits, she then had this sort of perfectionism, sort of guilty sort of feeling. She'd just sort of throw in the towel, and, oh, I can't do it, I can't do it. And then she'd pick herself up, she'd come back and see me and we'd go through it. And it was quite a process. But I am extremely pleased to say that she managed to do it. So I saw her two, I, you know, I saw her consistently over this time, but the last time I saw her was two years later, back in 2020, and she moved back to Sydney, so she's no longer my patient. And over that two years, she had lost a total of 28 kilos. She had done incredibly well. Um, her BMI had come down to 29, uh, fatty liver completely gone, um, hyperinsulinemia gone, HbA1c normalised. Um, I love this, her waist circumference had gone down to 81 centimetres, which is basically like, you know, ideal, almost normal uh, for a woman. And the most important change, these numbers are great, but the most important change is that she was doing it, so she had made a low-carb lifestyle sustainable for her. She wasn't perfect, but she was doing it sustainably. And when I rang her up to ask if I could talk about her in this talk, I asked, you know, just, just, just give me a quote for your experience. And this is what she said to me. Nothing else has ever worked. I white-knuckled my way through calorie restriction, through keto, but nothing could stick. I knew keto was right for me, but I could never make it stick. It wasn't until I addressed my thoughts that I could understand why I failed again and again. It is all in my mind. Now I can manage my mind. I don't fail anymore. It's not about being perfect, it's about being kind to myself. So she's, like, I, I spoke to her on the phone recently, so another sort of, you know, year later, and she's still doing really well. So two patients successfully changed their lifestyles, but both very different experiences. So why, why is this so hard for humans? You know, why do we wake up in the morning and say, I'm gonna eat low carb real food, but on the way home from work, we go through the Macca's drive through What are these blocks to lifestyle change? And there are lots and lots and lots of them. I'm gonna go through a few now. These are common themes that come up in my clinical practice, that come up in the scientific literature and come up in our online coaching programs. It's not an exhaustive list, but it is, I think, touch on sort of the main areas where people struggle. And I'm gonna talk about a few of the ways in which we do health coaching and counseling and mindset training to help people overcome these blocks. So really, like the first thing is diet confusion. And this is where education comes in. This is the really important bit of education. Particularly, most of my clients and patients have been on the whirlwind of like yo-yo dieting and being caught up in the weight loss industry their like, whole adult lives. And they've got a lot that they need to unlearn. They need to unlearn that calorie counting model, unlearn all of the toxic sort of diet culture messages. And also, this is really important, unlearn the learned hopelessness. Where nothing else has ever worked before, when you fail time and time again, you, your brain is set up to think that I'm going to fail at this as well. And it can become a sort of self-fulfilling prophecy, which is, which is really tragic and we need to unlearn this because as I hope you all know or are learning, that that a low-carb lifestyle actually really can work because it addresses the physiological changes behind why people get overweight and obese in the first place. It fixes the cause sustainably without hunger. So if you can do it, it's going to work. But sometimes there's a lot of mindset work that needs to be done to make it sustainable. And of course, you've got so much to learn. People need to learn how to do low-carb properly. There are lots of ways to do low-carb properly, and there are ways to do low-carb badly, particularly if weight loss is your goal. So people do need to learn the right way to go about it. They need to learn new habits, and they need to learn to trust themselves. And as metabolism heals and the normal hunger in society mechanisms come back into play, people need to learn to trust their own hunger. There's a lot to learn. This is where education is absolutely vital and absolutely gold. But there are still blocks. Education is important, but it is not always enough. Common block I see all the time is perfectionism. 
People have an all or nothing mentality. There's they will do low carb perfectly, really motivated at the start, they're going great guns. And then if they have a Tim Tam in the tea room at work, that's like, oh, stuff it, I can't do this, I knew I couldn't do it. Just throw in the towel, eat the entire packet of Tim Tams, go home, get ice cream on the way home, and then just go on a carb binge for the next six months. This happens. So, <laughs> and with our health coaching and, and, and motivational interviewing, we get people to identify this perfectionism thinking and, and coach people that it isn't all or nothing. It never is. You don't need to be perfect. You can have the occasional muffin at work, even if you didn't plan to, and still change your life and bring back your health. It's not all or nothing. And by encouraging people to focus on their progress and what they're doing well, you can overcome this potentially very toxic block. This is an enormous topic. The non-hungry eating, the conditional eating, you know, food, food is not just nourishment, it is so much more than that. We use food as a reward, we use food as a punishment, we use food to celebrate, to commiserate, we use food just, we have conditions to hop in the car and you eat. We, food is associated with family gatherings, with so many things. And this is a huge, huge topic. And it is a place where lots of people can come unstuck. And we do coaching around training people to kind of uncouple the emotion and food. And an enormous part of the non-hungry eating or the conditional eating is emotional eating. This is a really common condition in my patient base and my client base. And we have, it, it's, everybody can overcome emotional eating. This is a totally learnable skill. People can do it, but they need the right tools. And we tra train people to understand that emotional eating is a tool. It's, us just a, it's not good, it's not bad, it's just a tool that people have developed to deal with unpleasant emotions. And if you've got weight issues or metabolic issues, it's a tool that's no longer serving you well. So taking the guilt out of it actually is very helpful. And then getting people to come up with their own tools. What, what could they do instead to deal with these uncomfortable negative feelings and also, the second part is helping people to understand that uncomfortable negative feelings are a normal part of life. Sometimes, you know, they can be incredibly intense, but they are also a normal part of the human experience. And people can overcome emotional eating. Another really common block is the fear of missing out. You know, the super shiny cakes in the bakery. <laughs> I love this picture. Um, <laughs> The, uh, you go to the, the ice cream parlour and all of the beautiful, brightly coloured, sort of shining gelati, um, the pavlova at your friend's barbecue, even the crunch of toast of your teenage son's breakfast can elicit this powerful emotion, this fear of missing out. And our brains will scream at us, this isn't fair, I need this, I need this, I need this. And you can also learn to, to overcome this particular block as well. And it's learning how to challenge your thoughts um, all humans have this thing called a natural negativity bias, and you can totally use that with fear of missing out. You go, nah, toast isn't that good. You use all these little tricks you can use on your brain. And also a really important mindset um, training, mindset hack, is understanding that you can eat whatever you want. You can eat whatever you want, but the wondrous thing is that you change what you want. You can overcome FOMO. Slave to the scales. This is a common block. When the scales aren't perfectly showing the exact linear downwards trajectory that you expect that they should show, because damn it, I'm being good, people can just, like, it's not working, I'm just going to give up. This is really common, and it ties in with this learned helplessness that people have from the toxic diet industry. And when you, you're on a low-carb diet, it's quite different to short, sharp, you know, calorie restriction with, you know, Weight Watchers or Light and Easy or, you know, whatever it is that you're doing. It's the, you're healing your metabolism, you're nourishing your body, you're probably getting more muscle, more bone. Weight loss is not going to be Lydia. It isn't a straight process. And this is, this is what we help people understand. It's really going to be like this sort of jagged staircase. Sometimes it might even go up and then it goes down. And those little pauses and plateaus along the way are perfectly normal and natural. And the scales are just a false idol. And if people are easily upset by what the scales say, if they're easily sort of, if this is a real big block for them, we encourage people just to put them away, just, just put the things in the, in the bathroom cupboard and ignore them. There are so many better metrics you can use to assess your progress 
than the scales. And negative self-talk, it is a really, really significant issue. And we have a saying at Real Life Medicine, but, you know, you can't hate yourself in. You can't berate yourself well. It doesn't work. And self-compassion and self-kindness is a really important part of the behaviour change process. And this is well recognised in psychological theory. Because failures and slip-ups and, and, and bumps along the way are really going to be completely normal. That is just what's going to happen. That's because we are human. And if you view these little slip-ups and, and challenges along the way with self-kindness and compassion, it allows you to get back on track faster. It allows you to sort of walk this even path between you know, self-hatred and beration and just numb denial. Oh, it doesn't matter. I can't do it anyway. Just this nice firm but being firm but fair with yourself and it is a learnable skill all humans can learn self-compassion even if they're coming from quite a, a low base and it involves learning self-kindness understanding that we're human and learning to cultivate mindfulness all things that we teach people we love a metaphor like um i had real life medicine we use them a lot dr lucy is talking later on is he's an absolute queen at this and I think that language is important, self-talk is important. And I like to challenge people when they use these two terms, wagon, I've fallen off the wagon, and derailed, I've been derailed. I like to pull people up on this because your health is not like some passive sort of wagon ride that's being pulled along by a couple of horses that you're not controlling. And then if you hit a pothole, you know, the muffin and the tea room and you get knocked off the wagon it's like this idea oh, i got knocked off the wagon i just have to languish here in the grass and just eat all of the muffins because i've fallen off the wagon the wagon's gone no there is no wagon you haven't fallen off a wagon because you weren't on the wagon to begin with the other one is derailed oh you know i went to a party and my friends were having you know schnitzel and chips and beer and i was derailed i've just been derailed all month no your health journey is not like a train on these rigid tracks that if something happens and it falls off the tracks, it just has to forever languish there and rust and never, ever get back on track. That is not what happens. This, this is what happens. Your health is a gutsy, all-terrain, four-wheel drive vehicle and you are the driver and you can take this baby wherever you want. If you go down a gutter and you have some muffins and some chicken and schnitzel and chips and beer, it doesn't matter because you can just yank on the steering wheel and come back on the track straight away. You are always in control, and this car can go anywhere you want it. I love that visualisation. And as all of you, like, you will know, change is possible. I, all of you wonderful low-carb GPs who do this with your patients day in, day out, you know that change is possible. We see it all the time. I cannot unsee the wonderful changes that I have seen. It really, really is possible. It's not easy, necessarily, but it is possible. And the real magic happens with low carb because when you combine the physiology and the psychology. So low carbohydrate lifestyles, they heal the physiology, um, you know, behind the insulin resistance, the hyperinsulinemia, the what has caused the weight gain and obesity, polycystic ovarian syndrome, fatty liver, I heal that in the first place, especially when you combine it with intermittent fasting. And when you also manage the psychology and the mindset of lifestyle change, this is where the magic happens. Physiology and psychology. And if you want to know a bit more about us, for Real Life Medicine, we run three-month, 12-week programs. We've got one coming up soon, and you can speak to Dr. Lucy or I. We've got some discount cards to hand out today if you want. And in these 12-week programs, we really provide lots of education, so really, really intensive educational component, as well as weekly coaching, community support and accountability. That's the physiology and the psychology. Um, we, oh, this is a quote from someone who's just completing our current one. And she's doing really well. She said, I love the ease of information, the cooking and the coaching sessions and all the wonderful encouragement from the rest of the group. That accountability, really important, and support. Um, there have been so many words of wisdom that I've put into practice, such as planning, progress, not perfection, and most importantly, self-forgiveness. We also have a podcast, Real Health and Weight Loss, and you can check out our website and our blog as well. Thank you. <laughs>